We are going to work towards raising your awareness of the substance of culture, uh, identifying some of your own views and attitudes towards cultural differences, reflect on some aspects of your own culturally conditioned behavior, and last but not least, I hope to be able to discuss and evaluate specific cases of mediating between cultures in a professional setting, or at least start a discussion about that. So I promise that there is a question for you, colleagues. Now, can you look at the slide? You have one minute to consider answering question one and question two, okay? Do you know what the names on the screen mean? Which cultures do you associate them with? Are there any variants of these names in other cultures that you know of? Who would like to share? I can start. Okay. Uh, I associate the first one, fleur, with French. I think it means flower. And, okay, um, I, I agree with you. Uh, yeah, where I are you so. from? I'm, I'm in Italy right now. I'm from the University of Trieste. And uh, so in Italy, it would be Fiore, and it's also a name in Italian. Okay, John, good. I associate with an uh, Anglo-Saxon world, be it British, Australian, or American. I, I'm not sure, but it could be anywhere, like South Africa, even. Okay. And uh, as I guess it was one of the four, uh, um, I can't remember Apostles? now, the evangelists. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alexander, I associate with Germany for some reason. And uh, the only person I can think of is Alexander the Great, but I wouldn't know what it means. And the last... <laughs> Doesn't one, come from but... Germany, definitely. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And the last one, maybe I'm not. I don't know any Eastern European language aside from Russian, but it doesn't look like Russian. Uh, so I think this might be, I don't know, Polish or one of the. I have no idea. I would be guessing completely here. Okay. Thank you. So can mm -hmm. we invite somebody else, mm -hmm. another colleague, to comment, probably about the last name? So while you're still thinking, I can also share that Fleur. Uh, meaning flower, has a, uh, has a corresponding version in Bulgarian, although you, you won't be able to, to tell, because in Bulgarian we say Tsveta, Tsvetelina, Tsvetanka, so these are versions of the name, the woman's name, that means a flower. And again, uh, the, the idea is uh, to give such a name to a girl, uh, in order to make sure she's beautiful. You know, this is a, a wish that we encode in this name. I totally agree with Ron, and I think you can give examples from your own cultures and from different cultures. For example, in Bulgarian, uh, John, the version of John is um, Ivan. In, in German, it's Johannes or Jochen. In, um, I don't know, in Italian, what would that be? Giovanni? Yeah, Giovanni. Am I close? Am I close? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so on and so forth. Alexander the Great actually comes from our shared, uh, I mean, culturally shared roots, because Alexander the Great was um, the most famous king of uh, Macedonia um, in, in, the, in, in antiquity. And that's how the name spread across all European cultures. I mean, it's part of something that we have as cultural heritage. Uh, and then the last name is Malgujata. It seems to be a popular name in the Polish culture because on the Tifuri team, I have met uh, at least four or five colleagues, different positions, uh, who are called Malgujata. Okay, if there are no Polish colleagues, can you guess what it means? Does it... Does it remind you of something in your own language? In Italian, mal has a negative connotation. So it's so. not likely, yeah. People usually don't give uh, negative uh, meaning to names because when we give a name to somebody, we usually have good feelings, good wishes for this person. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay, but that's a possible approach. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you that uh, it's in Bulgarian, we have it, it's Margarita. And actually, in, in the modern Bulgarian culture, Margarita is associated with the flower daisy, because that's the name of the flower. But 
In the old days, when Bulgarian and Polish were more similar, because they are both Slavic languages belonging to different subfamilies, of course, but at a certain point there was more, you know, they were closer. And uh, Margarit was a name, uh, was a word which meant uh, pearls. So again, there's a, you know, uh, the idea is there, but the words are different in different languages because we have the name Pearl in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, right? Meaning that this woman is a special one. She's like, a, you know, something very rare, something very pure and beautiful. It, your turn. Can you present yourself, guys? What can you tell us about yourself? Uh, what's your name? Do you know what your name means? For example, I was named after my grandfathers, both of my grandfathers were called Nicola, and Nicola is a male name, and in Bulgarian, in the, the, the female version is Nikolina. And um, this, uh, we have a patron saint, Saint Nicholas, Saint Nikolai, uh, as we call him, and we celebrate it on the 6th of December. And that's a tradition. I mean, one of the traditional ways to give names to, to your children, to name them after a relative. How about you? Who would like okay. to break the silence? Yeah. Okay. My name is Joanne. It's I, I was born and raised in the United States. My mother gave me this name. Uh, my mother and my father are both Italian. And I was given this name, as far as I know, because my mother was watching this TV show and she liked one of the women on the show. I guess that was that inspired her uh, to give me my name. Okay. That's as far as I know. But they didn't choose the traditional Italian name. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and what is your job? What is your position at the University of Trieste? I am a CHEL, so-called CHEL, um, a language lecturer as, uh, of English. Ooh. So I teach Italian students on my courses, not, not only Italian students, just whatever students enroll in this university and in the degree courses where I teach um, language skills in English. Great, great. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, okay. okay, thank you. Can we invite somebody else? Uh, Inga? Please don't don't be shy. Just just take the floor. It's very difficult for me to to uh, you know follow both. My name is connected with Scandinavian uh, deity Inga. Ah. So something related with uh, defense of that god Inga's. Yes, I read in some encyclopedias. Okay. Yes. Okay. I am librarian myself, so yeah. that's why I'm interested in some, some such, such knowledge. Thank you. It's yeah. uh, wonderful to learn about that. That's another way to name your children, which I believe we share across European cultures, to associate the name with a certain deity, as you said in your case, or a patron saint. From, from the Christian tradition, but not all the names that are connected with deities comes, come from the Christian traditions. Uh, tradition, sorry, Some of them come from other uh, traditions that are associated with that cultural heritage. And you just demonstrated how complex our shared heritage actually is. Thank you. I can see the Vut um, uh, raising a hand. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I am connecting from Turkey, Antalya City and uh, Akdeniz University. Uh, my name is Dawood. Uh, it's, I think, Arabian name and it is the name of the uh, big king Dawood and uh, means, I think, that uh, a person who have good voice. Dawood okay. Is, yeah, it's, it's means okay. a good, good voice. I think okay. it correspond to David in, in Europe, I think. This is, it goes back to the to Alexander the Great. I mean, this is in this way, traditional way of naming people after great leaders, people who have made, you know, who have left a trace in history, yes? Yeah. As yeah. well. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Davut. Yeah. 
Uh, it's you. very interesting that Thank you, you that you're much. here to attend our Tifuri uh, webinar, which means that Transform for Europe has started attracting outside partners. Hopefully, we're going to meet somewhere uh, on other occasions as well. Thank you. Anyone yeah, else? Nice to be here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Can you, Ruta, very briefly introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ruta. I, yeah. I wrote in the chat. It's a Lithuanian name, traditional. It used to be traditional, now it's not popular. But it's traditional than I was born at the time. It's a name of flower. The traditional okay. Lithuanian flower. It used to, it's um, in, in, in villages, in yards. The girls uh, used to plant it and to to show for everybody that they have this flower. It's it's okay. most important. Now it's not yeah. so important and not 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 popular anymore. <laughs> well, uh, if if we go back to the initial examples, uh, the name Svetanka is not very popular at the moment here. So modern versions of this flower association have appeared, but but that's, uh, again, I mean, we've got a point of common um, things here as well. Okay, then, uh, Genovaite. Genovaite is, it is Christian name, Genevieve in French. In mm -hmm. French, I think it is very popular, but in Lithuania, this name is not very popular, even now as well. Um, uh, this uh, name comes from my father. I don't know why he get me this name because uh, my father is dead, so I can't ask him why my name is yeah. Genev. But what does it mean? It means the gen uh, gender uh, woman. It's uh, how to say in English um, the woman of family or of uh, all gender. So in my family, I have four boys. So <laughs> usually I said that my name is Genevieve, the king of the family. <laughs> as a, a woman. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Uh, good. Genevieve, what is your position at the university? What I do you do? I am associate professor in the okay. Business University. Very, uh, very, very nice to meet you all. Uh, so uh, the uh, next on my list is Ramune. And my uh, name is traditional Lithuanian uh, name and uh, means it is flower like a camellia. Okay, and what do you do at the university? I am student. You're still a student. And then is Rebecca? Uh, so my name is Rebecca. Uh, I don't know where is my um, name from. I think it's um, like biblical. Okay. That's all I know. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. What is your position? At the, which university are you from? I'm from um, Uni University of Pimorska um, from Slovene. And I'm an assistant. And then we've got uh, Thomas, who is our uh, host today. Okay, of course. Uh, so my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm from Lithuania. I'm working at Vitalis Magnus University. My name is Origins, comes from actually from my grand grandfather because his name was Thomas. Or I'm not sure if it was Tom Cruise because he was very popular at the time on television. So I'm not sure. My mom tells me that it was the, because of my grand grandfather, but it could be. A, like uh, Tom Cruise because he was very popular at the time on the TV, so you know maybe that's the case. Yeah. Okay. And we've got Vida. My name is very Lithuanian. I think there was a um, virgin that was protecting fire, so um, I got a goddess name, and um, I kind of like that. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Thank you so much. We've got Aurelia who wrote in the in the chat that her name is connected with gold, and we've got. Vachta. Hello. Yeah, I'm Birgit. Birgit, oh, Birgit. from Austria. Uh, I'm, I teach at the Tristine University. And my name, Birgit, is a Swedish name. My mother, I think, she gave me that name because of the opera sing, uh, singer, Birgit Nielsen. I know it means something like the proud one. Proud I'm one. not sure. Proud, yes. 
Okay. It's like, we it's can, not we can, Brigitte. Yeah. Brigitte. It's Brigitte. <laughs> it's Brigitte. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for correcting me. I, I noticed that when, when you started speaking that I read it in the wrong way. Thank you. Thank you, my dear colleagues. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have such a wonderful bunch of people coming from various cultures. And I hope this webinar will be, you know, the start of our new collaborations and meetings in the future, because uh, talking about culture and intercultural communication is something that we can we are not going to exhaust today. We're just going to scratch the surface. It's this is inevitable, actually. So I now to do a very um, simple activity to write a short definition of culture, your own. What do you think is culture in your opinion? To pick just a few keywords here that uh, to you, I think there are points of similarity in your ideas about culture uh, and also there are different uh, key things like uh, the fact that you associate culture with background, with language, but also with traditions uh, and traditions are mentioned more than once in your uh, ideas. Uh, language, history, geography as well. So these are the things that people share. And the key word, again, Vita here is a group of people. So <clears throat> this relates to, uh, you know, the way that we can think about culture. We can think about culture being something that um, is typical of a nation, of an ethnic group, but also of a smaller group, a smaller community of people who share, who live in the same place, or if you like a professional group and so on and so forth. So we've got this, um, you know, wonderful thing about culture that it has many faces. Uh, Aurelia also mentions values, which is important. Uh, we are going to go back to that in a moment. Uh, Vida suggests that a culture is associated with a particular way of thinking, acting, and so on. Probably you are aware that one of the theorists, one of the prominent theorists about cultures and intercultural communication, Hofstede, uh, uh, he, he wrote a book which is called Culture, the Software of the Mind. And this metaphor captures exactly what Vida has suggested here. Um, also, she mentions globalization. And this has to do with, you know, the fact that cultures, they are not static. They develop over time. They influence each other. So if we go back to the first activity about name giving, you see that we share things, but also things that come from antiquity have been adopted in many European cultures. So in a sense, this is what we are witnessing now uh, in this globalization period, probably in a more intensified uh, way. Uh, OK, and this complex mixture of new and old in Vida's uh, idea is also very important, which means that groups of people pass on certain key ideas, but each generation adds to that. So again, going back to this idea that cultures are not static, they're constantly developing. Uh, then Birgit says that it has to do with identity. We can speak about cultural identity. You know, sharing a culture with other people is something that helps us to identify as, for example, Bulgarians, Europeans, uh, university teachers, and so on and so forth. And also, she, she mentions different agents in shaping these identities like language, but also history, uh, the way society is constructed, uh, also our religious upbringing and religious background. Schooling is also a very important factor. 
Uh, Alessandra also uh, goes back to these ideas about values and traditions and history and literature. Good. And the vote has added that this is the social behavior of a particular group of people. OK, so just. Just to, to, to note something, if we think about history, literature, the arts and so on, this is some. To as big C culture, culture written with a capital letter and what the wood has uh, uh, written here is sometimes referred to as small C culture or everyday culture and both, you know, aspects are equally important. And both of them shape the way we react in certain situations. Uh, but these days with, uh, you know, contacts between people coming from different cultures becoming more and more common. And um, this small C culture takes precedence and it is very important to be able to, you know, get through this labyrinth of, you know, puzzles that encountering other people can uh, present us with. The purposes of our discussion today, I have chosen um, a dictionary definition of culture because uh, it's, um, well, it's not very complicated and uh, it, it captures different aspects of culture which already appeared in um, your ideas that you shared. So when we speak about culture, we speak about the customary beliefs, social forms, material traits of a racial, religious or a social group. Also the characteristic features of everyday existence, such as diversions or a way of life shared by people in a place or time. So we can speak about popular culture or Southern culture or Western culture and so on and so forth. Um, the second the second meaning that can be attributed to this word uh, is connected to the set of shared attitudes, values, goals and practices that characterizes an institution or an organization. So we can think about culture as being typical of a national group, for example, but also culture as being typical of an institution or an organization. And I'm sure you can give examples from your experience if I ask you to do so. And last but not least, when we say culture, we may mean the set of values, conventions or social practices which are associated with a particular field, activity or characteristic of society. For example, the culture of the English language teachers um, or the culture of IT specialists. OK, why do we need to talk about culture? This seems like a self-evident question that doesn't require an answer, but still I'm, I, I would like you to spend a couple of minutes thinking about your personal and your professional uh, experience. And I've got two questions for you here. The first question is, when was it important for you to take into consideration your own cultural background and or the cultural background of another person? Just think of an example. Remember a situation that you you associate with this. It's interesting that sometimes when you meet uh, students from abroad here in Lithuania, I, I am working in Vitota Smaglis University, yes, library. And yeah. sometimes I noticed that some people from some countries are maybe why it is connected if it's cultural tradition or one of them they they turn on light in their individual space they book and other cultures but I noticed yes it's it's a long time I noticed this that some from the east countries they turn off light and sitting with their laptops in dark. I don't know why. So it's it's very interesting. So, and I, of course, and I am a librarian, I, I want to help. I, I, I turn on the light and we, no, 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 
No, it's it's good for, don't for do me. It. So turn yeah, turn off okay. life. Yeah. And I don't know if somebody else uh, had such an experience, but but yeah. we here have this this interesting. And of course, sometimes when I also meet uh, students, they f- feel freely in the library. They know that we can use uh, everything here. And others ask me. And uh, also from the East countries that uh, I I should pay for the for that service. How much it, it costs? So uh-huh. it's very sounds uh, stra- strange. Uh, probably for the Vitautas Magnus University uh, as a as an organization, this is strange because you don't expect to to be paid for that services. So this may be something typical of your uh, organizational culture. And now light darkness light this is this can have to do with you know where we come from it can have to do with uh, our upbringing for example my my own upbringing is to use daylight as much as possible and not use uh, you know artificial lighting in the room but yeah. these days and especially with young people it can be because they're becoming more environmentally conscious you know trying to um um to be wise with energy so there are various possible explanations but it's a very interesting case that you share Inga thank yes, you so much yes i so so that's what yeah. was very interesting for me if somebody else had such experience yeah. of light because yeah. because really also it's not very good for 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 their eyes yes i i i, I think yeah. about also yeah. And uh, we are saving energy here in in the library uh, because we have daylight. Yes, in 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 the majority of the hall is is daylight. Yes, we are green library yeah. like our university. But I think that is somebody connected with culture. But I don't know maybe background of this. And that's interesting. Yeah, definitely there are cultural implications in what you share. And also, it it is, uh, I mean, it's partly cultural, partly the way we live. For example, yeah. me, like the colleagues from Italy, for example, and, and Spain, they correct me if I'm wrong, but if we live without sunshine, we feel very bad. Uh, for, for, for example, I 13 years ago, I think I spent two, two weeks in England in January, mm-hmm attending a, a training course and when I left my accommodation in the morning uh, the lights were on and it was still dark outside I went to you know the training room the uh, uh, institution where the lights were on and when we finished at five o'clock and I went back to my accommodation it was already dark and I started feeling very very bad I mean I missed the sun. The, you know the yeah. natural sunlight uh, while other people colleagues from other places they didn't have any problems with that so again it's uh, we are so much connected with where we come from and it actually has a lot of influences sometimes this is you know in the background of our minds sometimes we realize them uh, i mean some sometimes we uh, uh, suffer uh, so it's a very complicated issue thank you thank you Inga so can I ask you now uh, from the first group of statements is there a you definitely disagree with based on your personal experiences in intercultural communication um, I don't really oh, well, of course it depends I mean if this is a the first time you meet this representative of another culture, I wouldn't expect him or her to start behaving like me. I mean, if I were abroad, I would try to adapt to the local way of behaving, of speaking, of being, you know, try to observe what the local conventions are and try to not stick out as so different and rude. So, but I I, I would find it difficult for someone coming to my country to start behaving like me uh, because maybe people need time so they need to adapt little by little so that's why I was saying I don't know how long I've been in a conversation with this person 
But uh, okay. the one I agree with the most, I mean, okay, you asked the question, which one do I disagree with the most? So I'll stop. Yeah. There. Thank you. Okay, but then, uh, oh, oh, no, 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 go on. Oh, which is the okay. one that you agree with the most? Um, I would agree with number one because I wouldn't ask questions and I wouldn't say, why are you different? Why are you behaving the way you do? But I would try and understand where that person comes from, what cultural maybe uh, background they have. And I would try and continue in the interaction. I wouldn't give up because as we mentioned before, culture, we all have, we all come from different countries. We, we have a different cultural background. So I can't expect someone to be like me. And I, I, I understand they might, especially, you know, if people don't travel often. Uh, I see myself traveling in other countries and trying to adapt to the local to the local conventions, I don't know, for example. Okay, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I would agree with number one and try to be a model for that person to help them, to help them. But I think it would be a more constructive approach. I think the others are a bit more destructive, but of course these are just statements, so it depends on the broader context. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Thank you. Anyone yeah. else that would like to comment on the first set of statements? I also agree with number one because okay. they are not me really. And because now I have some experience and uh, because um, we have a lot of different students at university and I like communicate. So I always search the way to interact to find out why he feels differently here, uh, why he behaves differently and to help him because this is different space for, 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 for that person. He comes also okay. and don't know every. So <clears throat> first of all, I should help him. So I, I agree okay. with number one. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, round off this first part by saying that you have picked out, yes, what seems to be the constructive way to behave in an intercultural communication situation. Uh, so it seems that you are aware of the fact that our own cultural background gives us a bias, a certain bias. We can't avoid it, but it seems here in the group, we share a, an approach that is constructive in the sense that we try not to stick to what we know, to what we accept as normal and try to help. So I'm going to use this expression that you that you mentioned, try to be a model for this other person, try to, you know, lead them along the way to find out how things happen here because they may be different because somebody is from another country but they may be different because they come from another institution now um, probably those of you who have already visited other Tifuri um, universities you've noticed certain differences in uh, in the way that we work. I recently had this conversation with some German colleagues, not from Saarbrücken, but from um, somewhere else, from Berlin, uh, who expected me to resolve a situation for them. But I'm just, uh, you know, a lecturer and I have to take permission from somebody who deals with that, for example, the international uh, office people or the vice rector that is responsible for international um, uh, activities. And this, it, it does not depend on me. And then we have a certain internal procedure. Uh, and I had, I felt bad because I somehow had to convince them that I'm not, I'm not being obstructive but just this is the way things should be done at our university and I cannot, you know, jump this procedure. I have to follow. I'm sure all of you have been in similar situations and probably most of you would say, yeah, number one is seems to be the most constructive way to handle situations like that. Uh, sometimes we can predict 
glitches in the communication process by finding out about the some peculiarities of the culture that a person comes from. But uh, more often than not, these, you know, situations, they, they, they just happen. Uh, they appear on the spur of the moment and uh, we have to, you know, hold back our own judgment and think twice about our reactions. So that's uh, somehow I, you know, transferred from the personal to the professional. Sorry for that. Uh, but now let's take a look at, at the second group of statements. So which ones do you think you most agree with and which ones do you think you most disagree with? I think uh, I am going to try to comment a little bit. Uh, OK, <laughs> um, I think uh, when I'm reading that, I immediately think uh, very multicultural responses. Um, I think I'm very fortunate that I am teaching English and uh, <laughs> I have a lot of international students. So we typically start um, with the English way of thinking, which is also very different from the Lithuanian way of thinking. And I think we try to establish what's typical for English way. And uh, that makes the environment very inclusive because then everybody does something that's not their natural being. <laughs> uh, I think some people really like to listen more. Some really like to provide very honest answers. Um, and I think culturally, definitely there are quite uh, quite a lot of differences. But then I say, well, in England, because we are learning this tradition, this is how people should do it. So then it sort of creates this very common background that we are all different and we are trying to adapt to some kind of a cultural um, way of, of uh, interacting. Um, because I think all of them are correct and they're definitely appropriate ways of reacting. It's just that we come from different places and different cultures, I think. Yeah. OK, so uh, I would like to comment very briefly while other people are thinking what they would like to share. So um, I think language teachers are very lucky. We are very lucky because uh, uh, we, we do not simply teach a language. You cannot, you know, divorce language from the cultural conventions that go with the language. And also, this is an opportunity not to only to bring in conventions that are typical of another place and other cultural groups, but also to help our students um, or trainees, whatever, to become more aware of their own cultural background. So there is space in the language learning classroom for all cultures. And I'm speaking from experience here. Um, um, so th thank you for that comment. Any Anybody else? Yes, so uh, I always expect uh, that they uh, tell me their problems. Yes, firstly, I am waiting patiently and and after that they came more courageous and they talked with me because sometimes they, they look around, uh, look to me, I am that person who, who can who, help yeah yeah who <laughs> helped me yes i always try to help them and uh, speak uh, in more detailed way not with complex phrases but i have such history how to go and uh, to find to get that uh, service or, or to to find that place in the library in the uh, most shortly way for them so that we yes. feel that we feel good here, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. But if we're you, this first time. But have you noticed some differences in the way students approach you? Yes. Are they always open about their problems and questions? Sometimes yeah. we're simply standing and I provoke them to speak. Yeah, yes. yeah. Because so it, it really... I, I simply see that we, we are, yeah. yes, we are a bit... Uh, Absent minded, not, not absent minded, but I think that maybe they they be feeling strange, maybe because of yeah. a different way, because they maybe the library in the institution is differently. And of course, I'm always patient and waiting, waiting after that I encourage them 
And of course, because, for yeah. example, if I see American student or some from United Kingdom or from Germany, they are open. And of course, from it, Italy, they are open. They, they always ask. I know, I know that uh, I need more patience with, from, uh, with people from, from the East, maybe, because they, yeah. they, mm. they like silent, polite conversation. This is maybe yeah, from yeah. the ground. Yes, I always know that, that this is my duty to understand. And I always search, search how to wait to give that space for those students. And for the second time, when we meet, they are open. Maybe okay, because, everything yeah. depends on the first time. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Inga. Thank you. So uh, you've picked out the first statement. Can I ask whether other people have picked out other statements? Just to say briefly that both statements, both groups of statements, uh, I haven't um, chosen uh, randomly because um, I've got a hidden agenda. We'll uh, talk about certain main important theoretical approaches to discussing and, and describing cultures and uh, intercultural communication. So they go, some of them, some of these statements are related with E.T. Hall's ideas about cultures, others with Hofstede's ideas about cultures, a third group of them are related to a more recently published a uh, very interesting book, by the way, called The Culture Map by Erin Mayers. I've mentioned all these authors uh, here at, at the end of the, um, uh, of the presentation. So if you're interested, you can uh, pursue further and, and read for yourselves. Uh, but yeah, how we react in uh, professional uh, um, situations also depends on both our personal and our um, organizational culture and there may be significant differences and it's important now we, we we share this identity we identify as transform for Europe universities but also there are differences from one T4E university to another in the way that it is um, you know normal to go about things and also we all of us invite uh, international students or Erasmus exchange students coming from various places. And when they come and visit us, they are also part of the Tifuri Alliance, which makes this mix of different backgrounds even more, uh, you know, complicated, uh, sometimes richer. By all means, I see this as a very positive thing, but also we have to find our way to deal with them. So uh, let me go back to my presentation now and ask you, what do you think are the elements of culture? We already mentioned some of them like values, traditions, literature. What else? Can you write some key words in the chat now? We already have values, literature, traditions, speech, language, probably. What else would you like to add? Food, great. Conventions, manners, good. Religion, excellent. Architecture, perfect. Beliefs, great. I'm going to add dress codes, social behavior, art. Uh, I would like to introduce this very popular way of describing cultures metaphorically and this metaphor is usually referred to the as the iceberg of culture. Uh, why is culture likened to an iceberg? I think this picture demonstrates it uh, because there are certain elements which are there which shape the way a culture functions but they're not visible. Uh, there is, they are below the waterline if we think about the iceberg. There are others which are very easy to see. For example, I'll take your example with um, teaching students uh, elements of uh, British culture. Like uh, if you go to London, red buses, um, post stands, the, um, you know, the red double deckers, uh, black taxis. They are very easy to spot. You see them around when, when you visit London, for example. 
uh, but other things like, you know, why people would avoid mentioning certain words in certain situations. These are things that uh, we need more knowledge about. They're not easy to spot straight away. And of course, there are certain elements of culture which are on the waterline. So they are between what is hidden and what is very easy to see. Now, I uh, I would like you to think, while I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, um, I would like you to think where would you place the elements of culture you shared in the chat? You remember food, traditions, uh, conventions, religion, the arts. Where do you think that they would go? Below the waterline or above the waterline? For example, where would you put beliefs? Beliefs in terms of religion or beliefs in terms of one's own personal beliefs? Um, uh, beliefs, it, it, it's a very general term, I agree. It yeah. could be connected with religion, but it also could be connected with uh, what is the correct way in, uh, you know, um, behaving in a certain situation, yes. for example, treating older people or, uh, you know, mentor. Yeah, mm -hmm. or religion. Or religion maybe. Right. If it were religion, maybe I would place it below the level of water, underwater, because that's okay. something that people are not willing to change. If that's if I understood the question well. Yeah. yeah, Otherwise, yeah. Okay. Other, okay. other beliefs in terms of conventions, I would put that maybe above, but I'm not really sure because. Yeah, it's not an easy question. I no, agree. No, it's a very interesting yeah. question. Very yeah. interesting. Because question. if you think about religion, uh, for some people who have strong religious beliefs, and a strong identification with a certain religion, this is definitely below the waterline because it guides their behavior, the way they go through life. But also we can we can argue that this can go above the waterline because when we when we go to a church, for example, or to a mosque, there are certain conventions which we follow, which are very easy to see. Definitely. If you come to a, a, an Orthodox Christian church, uh, you shouldn't go, you know, in bare, bare arms. You, you, you'd better have, you know, a blouse with sleeves, you know, even if it's the summer, for example. If you, if you go to a mosque, you have to take your shoes off. And this is something that we can see. So we can consider placing this in both ways. So it's not an easy question, guys. Somebody wrote in the chat. Can I take a look what was written in the chat? Yeah, beliefs under trust, says Fabrizio. OK, so uh, I don't want to torture you. Of course, you'll continue thinking about these things. So generally, uh, the elements that we would very easily put above the waterline, they are considered to be the objective elements of a culture. For example, whether we eat using chopsticks or a fork and knife. Uh, how many forks and knives are we going to use um, in a dinner and so on and so forth? You can see here, smell and touch these things. They have to do with food, with dress, with behavior, the buildings around us, uh, with folk music and, and certain rituals which we can observe. They seem to be easy to explain, and some of them change very, very easily. Somebody wrote in the chat, let me see what this is. Philosophy under, okay, fair enough, yeah, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so these things that we put, the objective elements of culture that we would, you know, graphically put above the waterline, they are considered the easiest to change. But what happens with the elements below the waterline? These are the so-called subjective elements of culture. We are often unaware of them and their role. They shape the way we behave, but we it's not necessary for you to be, you know, aware of, of these elements in your own culture even. They're just in your software, uh, if I may use this other metaphor that we started with. But we can judge about these elements 
you know, the hidden ones, on the basis of what we see through patterns of behavior, through different notions of what is good, what is right, what is wrong. However, when these hidden elements are violated, challenged, uh, usually this is deep emotions. It touches people on a very deep psychological personal level and this may be connected with difficult situations also so I'm, I'm going to show um you know a way to put things on on the iceberg of culture things like food music dress anthem everyday object artifacts uh, greeting people for example um, we mentioned the architecture we mentioned literature these are things that we can see these are things that, that we can touch uh, and interpret uh, if necessary if we think about literature for example or architecture uh, language is often put on the you know on the water line because language seems to be a vehicle to connect these um, elements of culture which are deep down with what is above, what is uh, very easily seen. But definitely our religious beliefs, our perceptions of time, perceptions of social norms, uh, notions of beauty, ideas of beauty. Now, I mean, there are very striking examples uh, of what is considered beautiful in, a, a African, in an African tribe. Uh, and, and what is considered beautiful now. Although this changes, when I when I was young, the culture I, w I grew in, and of course I grew under socialist times, so partly this was because of this historical period in our development. But, uh, you know, uh, tattoos were not considered something good. While at the moment, more and more people are wearing tattoos, and this is something which is uh, considered nice. You can hear young people when they meet saying, oh, I like your ink. It was unthinkable when I was young. Um, yeah, so so these things can change. I mean, it's uh, uh, they're not very easy to change. They don't change overnight, but they can, you know, um, transform in a way. Uh, also below the waterline are uh, our rules of polite behavior, ideas of who we are, <clears throat> ideas of who the others are, attitudes to age, our prejudices, and so on and so forth. Now, I've got a very short question to you. Now, imagine a visitor to your culture. Like Inga gave examples with the students um, who, who visit the Now, I mean, is there something that they will notice immediately about your own culture? For example, I think with the vote we share that, uh, the way we uh, signal yes and no with our heads. So this means uh-huh, which is yes, and this means mm -mm, no, which is totally the other way around in Western cultures. And I still uh, hear people coming from Western cultures, I mean, visiting Bulgaria, saying, are you saying yes or no? I'm confused. Because we don't always uh, accommodate the way we nod and shake our heads. Sometimes we do it instinctively in the way that is accepted in our culture. Like, uh-huh, or no, no, no. No, which is the other way around. Now, can you think about your own culture? Are there similar examples? In Italy, for example, uh, maybe not so much after COVID, but young students at the university on campus, maybe they, you know, the young female students, they'll kiss each other on the cheek or just hug each other and be a bit more touchy-feely. Um, Whereas in other cultures, I notice maybe they they don't do that, or maybe the male students will in other cultures will shake hands, and um, others will use the fists like um, hello sign you know way of saying hello. Yeah. So maybe the way people interact when they see each other. 
Yeah, yeah. So greetings are very typical. And the convent, how many times do you have to pe kiss people? Do you kiss them at all? How do you do it? Do you just, uh, you know, cheek against somebody else's? Uh, do you do it with your lips? Uh, how many times do you do it on both cheeks? Do you start from the right or from the left cheeks, uh, cheek? So, so these are things that immediately uh, make an impression on people. If you've been to, to Asia, for example, let's think of China, have you noticed the way people give you things? For example, their business cards. They always give you things with two hands. This is considered to be the polite way. While if I do it, I'll, I'll do it like that. I'll take my card and I'll hand it, you know, with my right hand. Uh, and because I'm not... A, yeah, this is the way we do it. And we we don't add this, um, you know, notion that it is impolite. So gestures, Barbara, um, you're absolutely right. There are gestures which are typical to different cultures, body language, and they differ. And sometimes uh, they can be, you know, strikingly different and we can make mistakes even um, if we use the, you know, the wrong gesture. Uh, all right, so um, I, I would like us to go on. So uh, another um, thing that uh, cultures differ in is context. So we speak about low context cultures and high context cultures. Uh, if you look at this image, which a colleague of mine specially drew for uh, a course on intercultural communication I have in, included in the useful links. Um, uh, the first, if you look on the left, this is a graphic representation of high context cultures where you have to consider a lot of things like colors, like seating arrangements and things like that. So not explicitly said, but implicit present in the situation. Or in, in low context cultures, you know, usually Asian cultures are considered very high context. Um, as most of the European cultures would be placed on a more, more on a low context end of a continuum where things are more direct, although there are differences amongst European cultures, of course. This is, you know, an over general way to, to, to put it. But, for example, uh, if, you, if you are in, in China, because I started talking about China, I'll continue with that. Uh, um, people are put in a very position. So the highest in rank would be seated. If, for example, you have to take a picture of something and those that are lower in rank would be standing usually behind those that are seated. Or, for example, uh, during a lunch, the person in charge or the oldest person would be given the head of, of the fish. Because this shows, you know, this demonstrates uh, this person's special position in, in relation to the others. In my culture, the head of the fish is not considered to be the, the most, uh, you know, uh, delicious part of a fish. So it wouldn't be given to the person in charge. But it has this symbolic meaning in the, in the Chinese culture. So high context cultures, we understand about behavior, we understand about what is right and wrong, judging from a lot of elements in the context. And not, you know, there aren't explicitly uh, um, said, they aren't very easily evident. I'm sure you can give examples about that. I'll, I'll give you the floor in a moment. Another, another distinction between cultures is their attitude um, to time. We've got on, on the left, we've got this flexi time approach. When uh, 
uh, and on the right, we've got a representation of the cultures who believe that being precise, uh, being accurate in terms of time, following deadlines uh, is very important. And I'm sure you will agree, uh, despite the context you're working in, that there is a big difference among us. So, for example, our culture, although things are changing, uh, you know, it, we're close to this flexi time thing. I can't remember whom I talked to about that. We have the academic um, starting hour. For example, on our schedule, um, lessons are announced to start on the dot, for example, from 10 to 12. But the convention is that we usually start at quarter past. So we've got these 15 minutes time to gather together, get ready, have some small talk and things like that. And actually nobody expects um, or very few people uh, expect uh, a lesson to start on the dot. And it's OK. I mean, this is part of our traditions. Uh, while in other cultures, if the schedule is for 12 o'clock. They expect things to start at 12 o'clock. And if it doesn't happen, it's considered a waste of time. Submitting assignments. You can, um, a student can, can get a poor mark if they do not submit the assignment on time. It won't be considered. So we have to make sure we understand these differences among us again. Um, and, and the last one, of these uh, specifics concerns our attitude to space. How close do we do we stand in um, um, to, to, to each other in a crowd? Probably you've noticed that southern cultures um, have uh, we have a tendency to stand closer to each other. Uh, uh, while in other cultures, they would, uh, if you talk to somebody, that person would be, for example, in, in the UK, they would rather tend to be at an arm's length uh, from you. Um, so, yeah. Francis <clears throat> here as well. And if you go too close to somebody, who belongs to a, you know, um, to a culture that observes a bigger space, uh, then they they may consider you rude, you know, violating their personal space even. Uh, but but it, this is also, of course, there may be personal differences, but more often than not, this is encoded in the culture that we uh, that we have. Uh, that we share. OK, so um, now I'm, I'm going to ask you to share ideas about these questions here. You just saw that Birgit has written uh, in, in the chat. She, she uh, answered the first question. How do you feel comfortable when greeting people? She says at an arm's length. I just wanted to add that I think that um, these situations can happen very often even within one with people within one's own culture so it's not only an inter intercul uh, intercultural issue but I, I understand that uh, these are very interesting questions yeah 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 so, so as i said some, sometimes it's a matter of personal attitude uh, and not just because we share a culture that's that's yeah. correct mm -hmm. yeah i agree i agree joanne yeah, uh, so uh, uh, Birgit also says that um, with uh, uh, lateness, she doesn't have a problem. Uh, but um, in Italy, being late is quite normal. Oh, great to hear that. So we share that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I know that, for example, in certain parts of Germany, that would be a problem. In the UK, that would be a problem. Uh, if you don't follow the convention strictly. I can agree also because I am by myself 
and only in Italy I feel happy <laughs> because uh, nobody but, but judges you haven't, me. You haven't visited uh, Bulgaria. So if you visit Bulgaria, you will feel happy, I promise. <laughs> in terms yeah. of being punctual. So I yeah. should visit also, yeah. Because, yeah, you yes. should come. Yeah, so there are these differences um, in, uh, you know, in conventions. Uh, so how, how, what do you prefer to do? Do you prefer to talk to people in person or send messages or emails? I prefer to, to talk in person. Okay, because maybe I, I like to communicate. Also, I, I like yeah. to, to text them, but uh, I prefer conversation, live conversation. Sometimes this will be influenced by who you're communicating with. There are certain situations in which you would think twice whether to send a text message or write a more official text, yeah, depending on the roles of, of the other people. But these are these are things. I mean, um, things connected with time, with space, and with uh, the context we encounter on an everyday basis. And as you said, sometimes there may be differences within the same country, but people come, for example, from a different uh, organizations organization and they do not necessarily share the same attitude as you. As Berg, it says, depends on the situation in the, and the person, the one uh, yeah, about uh, writing emails and messages. I totally we agree with you guys. Um, that's that's right. OK, let's let's move on. Now, um, I would like to that focus a little bit more on this idea about us and them. So we perceive the world on the basis of forming these ideas in our minds about who we are and who is included in we and who they are and who is included in they. Have you noticed that uh, we have these beliefs, for example, the Polish are? The German are, the Bulgarian are, the Italian are. I, I can, because I mentioned the Italian, I can finish that. So in, in Bulgaria, the Italians are considered to be very passionate, very talkative, and always using a lot of gestures. Now, can you choose one or two of these sentences beginning and finish them? But don't think too much. I mean, uh, what, what is the first reaction that you have? The Polish are religious. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we have to say about our country or all countries? Oh, like you can use your own country, but you can use other countries, not all. I mean, we don't have to, to, to go through all of them. The Japanese are very polite. Okay. Yes. Ruta, what do you and have the in mind? Are hospitable very especially when food preparing food and uh, inviting guests <laughs> okay <laughs> Lithuania is a very first idea. yeah okay I th I believe that Bulgarians also think that they're very uh, hospitable I mean this is yeah. you know, there's this image of Bulgarian hospitality yeah. okay good German are uh, hard workers okay they work very hard okay Good. Others? The Americans? Very open. They're very open. Okay. They're My very direct. Very I would say they're very direct. All right. Now, we, we can go on. I mean, we can give more and more examples. But now, I would like to ask you, on the basis of what did you finish these sentences? What was your information? Did you have any background information? Did you read something in the newspapers or, for example, in a scientific monograph? Do these? Oh, yes. Yeah, yes, please. Welcome. As uh, as for the Japanese, um, I've I've read this and or heard about this in podcasts and while learning, trying to learn about Japanese culture. And as as for the Spanish, um, just from experience being in Spain, okay. but of course okay. this is a general statement. It's a general statement. statement. Thank you for that. 
it doesn't hold true necessarily for all the representatives of these cultures because Absolutely people not. differ. Yeah, some people are like that. Some people fit into this idea that we have, but others no. So uh, what are these actually? This is a very interesting conversation, but I'm also aware of the time. Stereotypes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are stereotypes, of course. So what are stereotypes? I'm not going to torture you to work in groups. I'm not going to use breakout rooms because we don't have enough time. But I'm going to share a few, you know, ideas about stereotypes, prejudices and ethnocentrism, which is connected with these terms and which is very important when we talk about cultures. So stereotypes are our shared beliefs or thoughts about a particular human group which can uh, which actually simplify reality. As you said, these are general statements, meaning that we think these people are like that. And we mean a general picture of people. We don't mean individuals there. Stereotypes may be negative or positive. Very often we hold positive stereotypes about ourselves, like hospitable, or the Lithuanians are very hospitable. Uh, but they can also be negative. Uh, English teachers here can tell you uh, that what, what uh, the following saying means. Let's go Dutch. When do we say in English, let's go Dutch, guys? I think when we want to split the bill equally. Yes, meaning that he, the Dutch, they don't like treating other people and paying for their bill. But uh, oh, no. <laughs> each, each person paying for what they have ordered. It's very funny, but the Dutch have a similar saying about the English. And you know from history that there was a period when the Dutch and the English fought for trade, for new lands and so on and so forth. So they had conflicts, you know, and this is this is one possible reason for this stereotype for such a stereotype to, you know, to be created and to stay because it, it gets encoded in the language. OK, uh, prejudices. So um, if we uh, can compare stereotypes to prejudices, we must say that prejudices are definitely something more negative. Uh, these are judgments about another uh, other people without really knowing them. We simply label them like that. I've never been to Japan, for example, but I may decide I may I may have read something about the Japanese uh, and I don't question that. So I have this prejudice about them. And prejudices are acquired as part of our socialization process. Socialization can happen at, at home. Actually, this is the first. Uh, level of socialization, then at school, then the media these days more and more and our social media, they have a very important role in the socialization process and they are very powerful in perpetuating negative prejudices and negative stereotypes. So it is really important to alert ourselves to these. Especially prejudices, they're very difficult to modify, to change to eradicate. Again, they can also be negative or positive. For example, we usually believe that our own culture has uh, these wonderful positive features. Um, because Bulgarians, for example, consider themselves to be very hard working. And I, I can challenge that. Uh, and the third um, term I would like to draw your attention to is, is uh, which is also very important in, in relation to cultures. What is an ethnocentrism? This is our belief that our own response to the world, which is connected with our cultural background, is the right one. And other people's, uh, you know, behavior, ideas, they are some, there's something wrong with them. Uh, that our values and ways of life are universal and that they extend to all people and that all other people should embrace them. And judgments, 
evaluations and justifications uh, when we meet with representatives of other cultures are very often influenced by ethnocentrism. So it is very important to, you know, to think about the way we approach both ourselves and others and try and try to disprove stereotypes and prejudices. This helps a lot in communication. I would like us to share about our own experience in, in intercultural encounters. Ever been in a situation in which someone else treated you on the basis of their stereotypes and prejudices about your own culture? And I, I can see I made a mistake in there because it should be there with E, I, R. Sorry for that. Can you remember such a situation? What was said or done? How did you feel? How did the other person feel? Well, I have been in Asia. It's very simple, actually, uh, example. But uh, when you go to Asia, most of the time they when they ser serve food, you know, they don't have like uh, normal tools for eating us for like normal tools for us. They ju just have chopsticks, you know. Uh, but mm -hmm. when you like uh, you arrive from Europe to Asia, they just uh, instantly go find a fork and a knife for you. They don't even ask you because they usually just presume that you don't know how to use the chopsticks or just you know they just bring you the normal tools that we use in Europe. That's not like a very serious thing, but you know they pr pretty much assume that you don't know how to use the chopsticks properly, so they just bring you the tools. You know? Yeah. Okay. So you consider this a positive or a negative thing? I don't know, not sure, but they definitely they see your face and they make, make the assumption. So I guess there's nothing negative about it, but you know, it's just yeah. they start kind of judging you because the way you look when they they see you not yeah. native, so they just pretty much okay. take care of it. Okay. 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 Point taken. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm I've been thinking whether I can share an example of my own and uh, one example with which comes to my mind probably I've shared it with other people on uh, uh, other occasions is uh, we had this project and I think it's relevant to our experience being T4E members. Uh, on a project some years ago we worked with some British people, uh, Italian people, Spanish people, Bulgarian people and not, not everybody who is not uh, from England is an English language teacher and is very good at the language. Uh, but somehow our British partners expected that language proficiency, high level of, of language proficiency uh, to be displayed in, in our communications. And I have this colleague uh, who, who is very active. Uh, she's also now the president of the Bulgarian History Teachers Associations, but she hasn't studied English formally. She picked it up in the course of working on projects and meetings, and uh, she doesn't use these very subtle and complicated English ways of demonstrating politeness. Uh, because the Bulgarian language doesn't have them, these grammatical means of politeness, we use, you know, certain lexical markers like we have this polite form of, uh, of addressing another person in the plural um, uh, or using certain words to mark politeness uh, rather than, you know, these complicated grammar. And I, I had to, um, I was asked by the project manager why my colleague was being rude because, because of the way she spoke English. You know, so that was that was the difficulty, you know, and it had to be it had to be resolved. Somehow it was expected that everybody would be able to use um, English at a very high level, although the project did not have to do anything with teaching English. It was and, and we had to communicate, you know, in order to uh, deliver certain certain products. Um, I, I'm sure you can give more examples like that. I would like you to list, I mean, make a list, each of you, please make a suggestion. There's no time to make a full list. Just one suggestion about a successful strategy which you believe facilitates working on intercultural teams.
and then be ready to say whether you have read about it, whether you have tried it out yourself, or you just thought of it because of the things we discussed. So the most important is to respect others and everything will be good if you're uniting language without difficult words, even if they speak your language, if they don't speak your language at all, I would I would add. And the case that I shared, uh, I shared it because it's, a, you know, it's a real life case. And these colleagues, I love them. I mean, we are on very good terms with them and they respect us really. But that was just a particular occasion in our, you know, common work. So these things, we, we, that's, that's why I was saying at the beginning that we have this software, which is more powerful than, uh, the, 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 than us. And it, although we respect others, we sometimes react in a way that is disrespectful and we don't even notice that. So that is the difficulty of being interculturally competent. Although you are prepared, you know, um, then uh, the second uh, the second uh, suggestion uh, just came to my mind, uh, but um, I mean, uh, it's prompted uh, by some other experience, but I, I think that uh, share this and, um, you know, start a practice uh, in the Transform for Europe Alliance that we need a list of uh, useful advice, something like a, a cultural survival kit. Uh, to give academics or students or staff before they come to us to help them get to know a little bit more about the institutional culture uh, and the national culture, not just the national, but also how things are done in our institution. And I think that that is going to be very useful. Uh, OK, then we have keep an open mind, build trust, listen actively. Very good. Be patient show respect for cultural practices and beliefs yeah or if sometimes we make you know a mistake uh there's no harm in uh, asking you know to be excused or saying okay i got it wrong but i think i should have done that instead of that and so on so be open yeah thank you very much for that uh, there's another practical suggestion here of implementing a getting to know you game or activity at the start of a session or a teamwork project with questions or prompts for each member to answer or provide input for. A great idea. And I can give you an example here from Zabrücken. Uh, on the first day of the Tifuri week before the opening, uh, a colleague here from Zabrücken had um, prepared a, a seminar on intercultural awareness raising for the students who come from other universities uh, to help them get to know each other and learn a little bit more about the local culture, which was, I think, a very good idea, although I couldn't mm, visit it because I was traveling on Monday. Got a long story short. There is a file which is called um, some useful links and I would like to explain why I have chosen these useful links. Um, the uh, Sofia University is a bridgehead for the Euraxis network uh, in our country and uh, our colleagues uh, from, from the office are very active in working with researchers and uh, several years ago, we were responsible for developing a tool which is called Intercultural Assistant. And it is um, accessible on, on the web, on the Euraxis portal. And so you can see some of these things I have used here, but there is more on the portal. And also I've given here some YouTube links of short videos that we prepared uh, to treat the the you know the question of intercultural issues some of them were meant for staff members others were meant for researchers but i think both you can look at both and probably you will find it very interesting to watch the testimonials uh we we interviewed uh incoming researchers from different cultures 
and they shared what they have found difficult when, um, you know, coming to Europe because all three came from all these countries. Uh, and what helped them to, you know, to get to function in a more successful way in this uh, new organization that they came to. So you might find some ideas uh, interesting. And the other thing I would like to share with you is the, the an outcome from a project which is still going on. It is finishing this year. It's called UniWellis. Uh, called Supporting Internationalization of Higher Education Through Professionalizing Services for Mobile Academic Staff. You can read more about it on the link, of course, but something that I would like to recommend, this is the UniWellis Practice Explorer. If you go to this link, you will uh, be taken to an online database of good practices where, you know, uh, this is a project um, which is shared among, among uh, Southeast European institutions. Um, and uh, this um, database provides information about proven practices in working with, uh, you know, incoming researchers, staff, PhD students, students. And you can use some of these ideas and implement them in your own practice. Or you can also suggest some practice of your own. If you think you have done something very successfully, you can also add it there. Uh, last but not least, this is the list of um, sources I used to prepare this presentation. Uh, of course, there is much more to add to this list, uh, but um, I didn't mean to prepare a bibliography on the topic because we, you know, the main reasons to hold the webinar were practical, raising awareness. Hope I have been able to, you know, um, get your curiosity uh, and also to uh, start you on reflecting about your own practices, your own beliefs, and uh, that meet next time, probably with some of you will meet face to face with others online, but that we can continue discussing this uh, fascinating question. Thank you.